<sighs> That's the problem when my batteries dies. I lose my train of thought because all of this is off the cuff. So now we have to start over. <laughs> What's going on everybody? Gunner here. Uh, long time no see, but today we are going to dive in and go over dropper shanks. I want to do kind of like a quick personal history because the odd thing is that we have uh, ended basically where we started and everything in between was exploratory and this is kind of the tried and true format. I want to go over who inspired this, where I learned it from. I'll probably start with that. Um, and then I want to go pros and cons. I want to show you guys why I think it's worth kind of pursuing and exploring as far as the pros and cons list um, and we'll do a full tool breakdown you know the tools I use everything you need to build it the wire selection split rings hooks uh, beads for for weighting or spacers or creating hollow fly kind of material dams uh, you know give me a sec mm. right stuff like this right this is your kind of goal finished product and I want to show you how to get there so let's dive in to the dropper shank So I was in Tennessee visiting my buddy Samuel Looper and Sam told me about this guy uh, named Scott Lewis. And this is kind of Scott's program. This is his build as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I was introduced to it maybe four years ago, three years ago, and Scott runs Alpha Trout Fitters. I don't know, uh, I haven't kept in touch with Scott or anything, so I don't know, I don't know anything, but hopefully Scott, you're doing well. Uh, but this is his design as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I'm not saying this is the same wire he uses and the same uh, shank length and builds and barrel wraps and all that stuff. I just mean this format, this simple barrel, straight shank, barrel. These things are perpendicular with a lower center of gravity for your split ringed connection. Like that's his program as far as I'm concerned. That's where I learned it from. Um, and the moment I saw it, like typical gunner, it's just like, I'm like, let's try something different. And so I went down this whole rabbit hole of exploring different shank builds, trying to put R bends behind this, different loops, doing full shanks with split ring trebles, um, and, and trying to do different length dropper arms and different length shanks and, and different barrel ties and different wire thicknesses. And I have come back to this, which is essentially where I started. Um, I can go over some of that history. I'll have to switch cameras to the computer because uh, I have to go picture by picture or else it's just a jumbled mess in my head. But <clears throat> that's what you need to know. So the simple layout is a barrel wrap with a horizontal hook eye, same way that you'd see a normal hook. You're going to run a dropper. Now the dropper is a pretty cool thing because what it does is it lowers the center of gravity. It takes the hook and it, it puts it below the fly. <clears throat> it puts the weight of an undressed hook and that's pretty significant because all hooks in fly tying are dressed that's the way fly tying typically works uh, but all hooks are dressed and when you have a hook that's undressed it's just a piece of weight right it's, it's just it's like a keel uh, and so normally you have a hook and you have all this water resistance on it you have all this neutral buoyancy and natural material and maybe it has lead eyes and and you're using all that to kind of create what would be uh, stability for the axis that the hook gap orients the fly towards, right? Because the hook gap is undressed. So you have this kind of naked weight that's hung down below the fly per the length of the gap. That typically controls keel if you build your fly symmetrically. Uh, symmetrically. But <clears throat> the dropper is really cool because it, it gives the mass of a, a naked hook leverage. Um, now that does a few things design-wise that you have to be careful of in that if you have loose limp material, like let's say a bunch of hackles coming off the back, uh, this will simply kind of hinge down, right? Because you have this big heavy, maybe a treble or a really big heavy single that's kind of pulling down and you don't have anything to resist it. So this kind of dictates how you design your flies. And, and simple thing to do is to do synthetic heads. Uh, so right, a strong fuzzy fiber or an SF blend stacked head uh, with some glue and some plastic eyes, right? The plastic eyes have a higher specific gravity than water, so they'll sink, but they'll slink slowly. And that'll counterbalance that shank so that it rides more or less level. So that's just a simple solution. Don't put a big uh, deer hair head in the front uh, and then you're going to get this jackknife up and down and your fly is never going to go truly and do anything in this nice lateral plane. It's always going to be up, 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 which is not usually what I like. <clears throat> so when you're designing flies, uh, a few simple things is just be aware of the balance. 
Uh, be aware of your hook weight. Cool thing about that is you can change hooks, right? So if you have like a, a two watt treble and you're like, that's way too big, it's not set in stone. The cool thing about these loops is you split ring the hook to the loop after the fact, which means the fly is essentially modular to a degree, right? You can change your split rings. You can go from a 15 pound or a 20 pound, which maybe that's your breakaway if you have a really thick leader and you snag. Maybe your split ring is your failure point. That's a cool thing because you can just put a new split ring and a new hook on when you get the fly back. Uh, but maybe you're in a saltwater context, you're not worried about snagging, and, and you want to put like, you know, a big three-aught saltwater inline single on there. Now you can put a 50-pound split ring or 60-pound split ring, right? So that has uh, the pros and cons of it could be a breaking point, and you can change the weight of that hook to get a kind of a different balance. If you have a really buoyant head, you can go from a 2-aught to a 1-aught to a 1 to a 2 until you find something that works, and then you kind of have learned from that experience to design better in the future. The other simple solution is always have some sort of sinking head, right? So all synthetics, for the most part, sink. They sink at different rates because they're not extruded out of the same material and same specific gravity, which is molecular density relative to water, right? That's what causes things to sink. That's why oil floats. <laughs> Oil's still heavy. You buy a gallon of oil and it's still heavy, but oil floats because it's lighter, it's less dense than water. So your plastics that are extruded for, say, strong fuzzy fiber and SF and slinky and all that stuff, they sink. They have a negative kind of buoyancy. They are higher specific gravity than water. Then you put like plastic eyes, you put glue on it. Uh, you're basically creating this counterbalance system so that the head will dip, but now the hook's dipping and you get a level riding fly. So that's just simple problem solving. Now in the case of the beast, because I do this so often in my beasts, we're using a stiff tail. We have that lined through with monofilament uh, that has no memory that's in the 30 40 50 pound range so all of this drag all of this material supports that weight and so a beast you can still do a bulkhead you can still put a nice big pushy head on there because your tail material is now supporting that raw hook weight so it does have some design things you're going to need to work for it's not just hey put a dropper shank you'll be fine uh, and so just be aware of that because you, if you integrate this into your tying, you have to design around it. You can obviously imitate some of the flies that I might share uh, moving forward, but you have to ultimately tweak it to your tying style, your materials choice, your tail length, stiffness, rigidity, material selection, all that good blah, 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 garbage. <clears throat> so the cool thing is, uh, and I think the most interesting aspect of the dropper shank has to do with e-sox fishing. Now you could take this into the saltwater realm for say barracuda or shark, uh, but in e-sox fishing, they typically don't have serrated jagged teeth for biting and cutting, but they kind of just puncture straight down. And they, when they eat really large forage, they tend to grab them in the middle. They tend to take them down to the bottom. They tend to mash them and slowly turn that food head first. Usually the initial attack, unless it's a smaller prey item, is not the eating, it's not the killing. They do that down there on the bottom. First, they have to catch it, they have to grab it, right? Uh, and so they typically aim for like center mass. <laughs> they typically aim for the parts that's gonna cause the most damage, that's gonna stun the fish, that they're gonna get the best hold on, their teeth are gonna puncture, which means they typically aim behind the head towards the middle of the fish with really big flies, and you'll see I kind of only do this on big flies. You can obviously take it to smaller scale. Scott Lewis takes it to a smaller scale, but I typically do this on my 9, 10, 11, 12 inch patterns, right? And so you can see if I were to do this on a short shank hook, this one has some rigging on it, so ignore my rigging. This is a, an inline spinner idea for fly fishing that I might share with you eventually. But here's a short shank saltwater hook, right? So a fish could come up, wham! And if he ate that, if he ate that, you see this hook point? It's not in his mouth. Now, I do have a stinger rig on here per Sadati Slammer that I, I try to salvage this fly with. You can see it's an interesting <laughs> stinger hook placement that was after the fact. Uh, but if a fish comes up and you get a positive eat, you get a muskie to smash this thing, you didn't hook the fish, right? And that's infuriating. But if you can slip that fl hook back, it'd be dangling you know, right here, right behind the head you're gonna hook that fish. And so uh, this allows me to run 
a customizable, I can, I can adapt this to whatever pattern, whatever length, however far back in the fly I want that hook um, from say, you know, a one inch, one and a half inch bucket mouth striped bass maybe uh, to like two inches, this is a two inch of about 50 millimeters or a three inch dropper shank to get that hook placement farther back for the species that I target. And I think that's a big deal because I don't like stingers. I don't like it when they get hooked in the outside of the face or the eye, or you have two hooks that maybe are pulling away from each other and doing weird things. I just want a single hook. I just want a single hook and I want it in the right spot. That's it. Now you don't have to drop the trebles. I know I, I do that because I'm comfortable with it. And people like to do this thing where they're like, if it's a treble, it's not a fly and that's not fly fishing. And it's like, you make your rules for you. You don't make them for me. <laughs> Take a hike. I don't like your argument, okay? I can use the treble if I want, uh, but if you don't like that, the way to get the proper hook orientation is with something called an inline single. These are designed to be dropped. They will keep that orientation being, uh, you know, perpendicular to your hook eye. It'll be hook gap forward the way you anticipate with your typical fly designs, right? So that's what you want. You want something called an inline single. And VMC makes that in a whole range of sizes from like two to three aughts to five aughts, freshwater and saltwater versions that you can then integrate with whatever split ring you want. <clears throat> so I think we've talked about uh, two or three of the really major pros, right? Split ringing hooks, using that split ring as an optional failure point, uh, the modularity of being able to change out hooks to modify the balance of your fly if it's not designed kind of to your desires right out of the box. You can change some things like that. Um, customizable shank length to move hooks rearward. Those are all cool things. Uh, you can take hooks off and use flies like this to practice cast. Uh, of course, you'll, you'll be lacking the hook weight, so it won't cast 100% true to its casting style, but pretty cool. You can use this to demo fly casting and you're not going to rip hooks through the grass or anything like that. Um, and the third or fourth, fifth, sixth, I don't know what number we're on. One of the cool things is you can build them pre-rigged with either material dams or weight. Uh, and so like my slammers, this is a Mark Sadati slammer, it's got two steel beads. Now they're hollow steel beads, they're designed for lure building. And I have these suckers in 0.2 grams, which is like, be like large bead chain. You have 0.4 grams, which is kind of like small lead eyes. I have 0.6 grams, which is like medium lead eyes. And I have 0.8 grams, which would be like an extra large lead eye. And so that's just for reference, because Sadati has weight in his flies to weight balance them. And so it's like, I can take these beads, I can use them pre-integrated into my shank as a material dam, uh, and to nose weight that fly, give the fly stability in the air, balance that fly with weight relative to air resistance so that it flies true and doesn't negatively impact my fly line. You can do so many cool things that you can't do with a commercially bought shank, which also doesn't have your lower center of gravity to guarantee that the hooks in the fly keel. Um, aside from that, if you don't want it weighted, but you still want the material dam, you can come in with plastic beads. Now you gotta be careful if you smack crap like plastic on rocks, they will break eventually, and then you won't have your material dams. But if you fish a lot of still water or big river where that's not something you do, right? Because everybody fishes differently. Like saltwater guys, I shouldn't say that. Surf guys probably aren't smashing these into the rocks, except maybe on your back cast. See, everybody's different. Like if you're in a boat in the middle of the water, do what you want, but you can use plastic too if you wanna do it weightless. So it opens up the door in many, many realms. So that's everything you should need to know, kind of pros and cons. I didn't really talk about cons. Um, some people are worried that this might bend out, this 90 degree bend. Uh, of course, you can run that straight. You can run that just in line. You can see the one that my spinner's built on is just a double inline barrel root loop. Um, or you could reduce the severity. You could go from like a 90 degree bend to a 45 degree bend, which would reduce some of the leverage. Um, you could increase the number of bail wraps. I typically do two to three. These are all three. And so, uh, you know, this is 051. You could probably catch a shark on that and it's not going to bend out. This is the wire that I use. Uh, this is what commercial big game trophy, you know, musky builds are made out of 051 or 062. And the tool I'm going to show you can work with both. So that's what you're going to want. So let's dive into the tool. Let's dive into the wire. I will specifically show you kind of slowly um, 
so that you guys have a step-by-step -step for how this tool works if you're interested because it's the most cost effective and you get to do it in your hands which is something I wanted I wanted to be able to do this in my hands so let's do that so wire what you're looking for is something called torsion straightened stainless steel wire now I get all this from lureartsonline.com I don't have a partner with them I don't have an affiliate nothing I just they got wire and I buy it from them <laughs> but it's a place where you can find it right so it's 051 is the diameter so 51 thousandths of an inch diameter stainless steel wire uh, this is what is currently manufactured for commercial lure builders to build stuff for muskie and pike and whatever species you're targeting now you'll get the big stuff in one pound coils you'll get smaller diameters like 043 035 031 uh, in these kind of like quarter pound coils you can use any tool to do this. You can use your one-step looper tools that everybody raves about to bend this wire. You can make your own shanks with our bends with this wire all you want. Uh, but the moment you step up into kind of like a big game musky wire 051062, you kind of need a professional tool to work with it. Uh, I tried using some one-step loopers and just sheared the nose right off and snapped those suckers. So you need a pretty big professional tool. Uh, the tool that I use is called the Dubro Bucktail twister tool again I, there's no affiliation this is just what I found that was cost effective that I could do in hand which I didn't want like a, a like a, a wire bending station I didn't want something that I had to bolt down to the table I didn't want to have to go to the garage to do this I just you just hold it in your hand now you can uh, put this in a bench vise if you want your hands to be free but you don't have to and so uh, the twister tool it just comes with a post to make your your uh, eye diameter and then it comes with a a small notch here to make your barrel wraps and that's it now you can do this and and make your barrel wraps you can do this to make our bend shanks it's a little tricky you have to you have to uh really work through it slowly and think through that even if i explained it to you you'd have to work through that but let me show you exactly how this works so i kind of have a section here uh, the torsion straighten wire I guess all the tools you're going to need. You're going to want some really nice nippers. I like the front flush face to get in there and cut really tight here. You can always file this down if you're worried about something catching on it, but I've never had like my line hook that and break or anything weird like that. Um, you're also going to get a hex wrench with your kit that you're going to want. You're going to want just a pair of pliers. I had this really nice multi-tool you've probably seen, but that's currently in my 556 ready rig from T-Rex Arm. So that's what we got. Uh, but you're going to take this, cut it to who knows what, you know, 10 inches, 12 inches. When you buy, you know, a one pound spool of this thing, it doesn't feel that bad wasting two inches here and an inch there. So just get the big stuff and don't worry about it. Now that'll have some memory. This is the end of another one pound spool. I've literally bent one pound of this wire. Uh, if you're curious to how many times I've done this, I've gone through an entire pound of wire just for personal builds, not even like commercial stuff, just for personal builds. Uh, but I will bend that kind of just loosely in my hand and make it more or less straight. If you spin it, you'll get a really good idea of if it's straight or not. You can see I have some up there, but I'm going to cut that off anyway. Now you're going to put your long end, you're going to wedge it between the post and this, this line right here. Your short end is going to be your tag. This is what's going to form the loop. It's going to form the barrel, and then you're going to trim off the excess. So you always got to keep that in mind. The finished shank, the shank length, everything should be left out here. <clears throat> you're going to take your wonderful leverage arm, which has a little notch on it that you can manipulate that wire with. You're going to first bend it towards the wall. That's going to give you your perfect straight section, and we're beginning to form the loop here. And then you're going to wrap that loop around. Now I go past 90, just a wee bit past 90. You can see it's not straight out 90, it's past 90 to really get a tight barrel wrap. And there will be a small gap there. You can see that's not perfectly touching. So I'll just kind of crush that. So that wire is really, really tight in there. Give it a little preflex. Now you're gonna drop it down this hole. There's a nice little hole right here that the wire's guided through. Wonderful, wonderful, come here. Lock that against my barrel wrap maker. You take this thing, which is all marred up here because I've done this so often. And you do your one, two, three. Now, if you stop with the eye 
parallel to the tool, the eye is parallel to the tool, that'll give you a frame of reference. If you always stop with it parallel to the tool, right? Consistency is the mark of a professional. Always do the same number of turns. Always count, I go one. So I started here, one, two, three. So you know every single time, stop perpendicular. Uh, it's in line with my wall. Everything's good, everything's good. You wanna be able to build these the same way every single time you do it. <clears throat> and you can see I have an inch of tag. Not really the end of the world as far as being wasteful. Your flush cutters will be able to get way up in there, hold your tag in so it doesn't go shooting across your room. And there is a super clean, super simple barrel wrap that can never open up. Now this is where you come in. I will pin that with my pliers. You can see my, my kind of grabbing, my hook orientation is that way. And I'm just gonna use this long piece of wire for leverage to bend that sucker flat, relatively flat. And then I'm just gonna make sure that it's in line. I like that, looks great. <clears throat> So that is now my dropper, that is my bend. Now you can take this, and if you don't know uh, conversion, it's 2.54 centimeters per inch, which is two, I guess 25.4 millimeters, right? So if you want like a 50 millimeter shank, it's about two inches, close enough, right? If you want a 80 millimeter shank, I guess 70 millimeters, what would that be? 75 millimeters would be three inches, right? 76 millimeters would be three inches. So keep that in mind, if you've used commercial available shanks in 40, and 60 and 80, basically you take that number, 80, and you divide it by 25, and you'll get two point whatever, or three, or 3.1, that's your inches. So you take your millimeters that you want, you divide it by 25.4, that'll give you your inch conversion. Shouldn't be that complicated, I'm not trying to make this complicated, uh, but I'm just gonna make a 50 millimeter shank, <laughs> take a Sharpie, and mark it at two inches. So I have a black mark two inches out from that barrel wrap. <clears throat> and this is how you get them to be the exact same every single time if that's what you're looking for. Now remember, the tag end that you're gonna cut off goes over here. So my loop is up into the thing. I'm gonna put my black mark on the edge of the tool because I need to eat up some space with my barrel wrap. So that's just how I kind of visually uh, pay attention to that. Now this is gonna get in the way. And if I wanted to, I could put my beads on right now. Let's just do that because I, li I like to build these with beads. These are hollow steel beads that I got from thornbrothers.com. 3 16th hollow black nickel bead from Thorn Brothers. Again, there's no, there's no relationship there. I just, I was at their store in person. I was like, hey, steel beads, wonderful. <laughs> I bought some. Uh, so there you go. <clears throat> but I can now thread those beads on. How cool is that? You can't do that with any commercially viable shank. Now it's weighted, it'll be nose weighted, it'll be weight balanced relative to the size and air resistance of a beast fly, on top of the fact that I can use them as material dams so I don't have to hollow tie everything. It's so cool. And it doesn't change the way you build it. So everything's back to where it was. Take your lever arm, bend that thing flat against the wall. Now you have a bunch of stuff that's in the way here. Bring it till it's in the way, pop it under. Bring it till it's in the way, pop it over. It, it, <laughs> you'll get really good and it's really fast. It's not a big deal. Don't let it give you a hiccup. <clears throat> Come in here and do the exact same thing that we have already done. Again, that line is past perpendicular for the sake of giving me a really tight barrel. Now, because I can't thread this through the thing, yeah, you gotta use the little nut over here to get your wire back into the groove. That's what the hex is for. I suppose I should make it tight. There you go. And then we're gonna do our three barrels. So I'm starting over here already. One, two, three. Make it exactly parallel. And because they were kind of done offset from each other, they should be nearly perfectly perpendicular. Look at that, I'll show you this. I don't, I don't have to tweak anything because uh, of the way I do it, they, they come out dang near perfect every time. So perfectly vertical, per perfectly perpendicular. The hook eyes are in the exact orientation I want. I put that in my vise. I tie a good old beast tail on there. I got three beads to do hollow ties on that I don't have to hollow tie. A little bit of nose weight uh, to balance out the weight of the hook and weight balance the fly with a two for one, and that is the dropper shank. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah... 
Let me just real quick, because this will be a longer video, that's fine. Let's put the GoPro on the computer and I'll kind of go over just some of my personal history here uh, and how I've come back to simple, really just come back to Scott Lewis's kind of original design here because, uh, you know, kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, it kind of never fails. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay, never mind. <laughs> So that sounded like a cool idea, and I, I, <laughs> I had gone through and found all the pictures and had them on the computer, and I, I closed them out. I'd close them out. I don't know <laughs> why I did that. Uh, but here's a pretty good example of, of kind of like an old school one. It's like four or five 40 millimeter shanks with treble split ringed on. So it's kind of like a game changer. Uh, instead of doing the dropper shank, I have dropped shanks. Uh, basically on the bottom of the R bend. That was one of the first things I tried to do. I tried to do a dropper like this that had an R bend sticking out behind it. Uh, I think that one's in my garage, actually. Yeah, this is it right here. <clears throat> so again, a unique inline spinner idea that I haven't showed anybody, but this is a dropper. Uh, it's a really, it's got a lot of leverage on it. It's like a really long dropper that has heat shrink tubing and uh, in two different split rings trying to get the right orientation. The treble's been bent on it because I hooked a big fish <laughs> or is snagged up, but that has shank behind the, the drop down, right? So I did a, uh, a R bend in the back and then a drop and then a barrel in the front so that I could dress the back to support uh, the naked weight of the hook. That was a pain in the butt. My goodness, was that a pain in the butt to try to bend out and to try to tie on. Uh, not a fan of that, even though it's a very fishable fly and has a good, cool little spinner rig on it. <coughs> Apparently we're doing show and tell now, which was not my intention. Here is a, this was a pretty cool bucktail, slinky, brushed, T-bone, synthetic T-bone, a Blaine chocolate style T-bone. So it's a shank, shank, uh, and then a hook. I, I overbuilt the brush. It's air resistant beyond belief, but that thing swims so sick. Not very fun to cast, swims unbelievable. But that's kind of like a variation of this, right? Blaine's T-bone, which has been around forever. Not trying to say dropper shanks, whatever. The timeline of events doesn't matter. But the whole idea of putting that hook farther back Shank, shank, hook, right? You got a 40, a 40, and then they might be 50s, actually, I don't remember. And then a big old hook in the back, and even that four out now looks tiny because that flies quite a bit overdressed there. Get back in there. Uh, we got my stiff shank rigs. I haven't explained that stuff to you yet. Ah, here's another one of those. It's got like four 40 millimeter shanks and then it's got trebles that are split ringed down. What a pain in the butt to tie on, uh, but you got two trebles on it. It's almost like a European style build as far as how they run their trebles in line under their soft plastic swim baits. So it's kind of like a Euro style wiggle tail, big old bucktail profiled game changer-ish dropper treble fly. So I'm dropping things off an inlined R bend, which is kind of a pain in the butt. I'd much rather run that with a single R bend and then a titanium wired stinger out the back. Hook shank hook. Here's one. This is a good one. I didn't know this one was in here. <clears throat> this is a, I'll put a picture of this one. I got pictures of all these. I'll put pictures of all these. I didn't realize I had all the flies here. This is a dropper shank in the front with an R bend in the back so that I could trail shanks off an R bend that wouldn't fail, right? So one of the things that, one of the issues you'll get is if you do like a dropper shank and then you have a wire connection to trailing shanks, then that wire connection at some point is gonna fail, especially if you put a hook back there uh, that's gonna be putting a lot of stress on it. So I put an R bend in the back um, so that I could run my beast, which has a stinger hook with a rattle on it. So this thing was a pain in the rear end to do. Uh, really cool fly. I can, uh, it's just not fun to tie. I would rather do my simple beast tail, no hook in the back, put that hook maybe back another half an inch and it would be kind of single hooked perfection 
uh, whereas trying to put a stinger hook in the back, having to do an R-bend behind the dropper, huh, what a pain in the butt. <clears throat> I think that is most of the history of it. I suppose I tried doing things like this, so you try displacing the hook uh, back, but not back too far. So this has a, <laughs> it's got a trailing shank, it's got a hook in the middle, a 6 aught, and then it's got a front shank. And that's a custom barrel wrapped R bend that I made with that same tool, right? So you can you can make articulated shank R bend barrel wrap that you can put a hook behind. I know you guys probably can't see this crap, uh, but that's kind of one of those things that you play with, right? So it's like shank hook shank hook hook or uh, <laughs> shank hook shank 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 hook uh, shank 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 with dropper hooks on trebles. Um, and really, it's fun stuff to play with, don't get me wrong, trying to do all this crap. Uh, but coming into just a single dropper and then have long tailing materials, make the length of that dropper kind of proportional to whatever fly you're building to get the desired hook placement. Uh, if you need a long tail, I revert now to beasts. I'm not going to necessarily do uh, shanked uh, stuff like this. I'd rather just do a build a beast on tubes. Um, or if you do do shanks but you don't put a stinger hook, then you can just do a wire connection. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the monofilament adds rigidity at that bend to lift and support that hook weight. It makes it so simple. And if you just do long tailing materials off the dropper, just do a synthetic head. So I've kind of come full circle from all of this stuff. I got some just floating in the bottom of my thing here. Right from all of this stuff, <laughs> it, needs, it needs like a five pound plate at the bottom of it uh, from all of this stuff to just a simple dropper rig uh, and that's kind of been my staple for the past year and a half i've put some really big fish on it i've had no issues whatsoever i had a friend put a massive 50 incher on it uh, nothing bends out nothing fails um, simple build simple wire bending uh, integrates with any vice perfectly gives you some modularity um, and customizable shank length with material dam slash weight. So that's full circle. That's big picture. That is the dropper shank build. Thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll catch you in the next one.